In 2017, I spent six weeks living off the grid on a nine-acre permaculture farm called Finca Tierra, deep in the tropical jungle off of the Caribbean coast in Costa Rica. Part of the experience was learning about the plants of the tropics, which was a bit of a wake-up call for me. Because the tropics are sunny all year round, the plants that have evolved since that climate have been designed to last all year round. They have a longer lifespan in general and tend to be hardier, able to withstand extreme heat and rains. I was there in Costa Rica as part of a permaculture design course, where we basically learn how to design sustainable living systems by working with the land. And as we got into the plant identification part of the course, I began to start to see some patterns. Basically, the annual herbs that I grew up with in Los Angeles, like cilantro and oregano, which die in the winter and have to be reseeded in the spring, actually all have tropical counterparts. For example, there's a succulent called Cuban oregano that grows in extremely dry conditions and actually tastes exactly like oregano. With wide, soft, and fuzzy leaves, it looks nothing like oregano though, but it grows all year round and needs very little maintenance if any. I grow it on my balcony in Taiwan, and to propagate, you basically just cut off a stem and put it in the planter. It's actually a really popular house plant in Taiwan and gives off a nice fragrance. And when I was on the farm, every time I walked around on certain stone cobblestone paths, I'd start to get a distinct whiff of cilantro. I didn't know where it was coming from until I realized that it was emanating from these dark green leaves with sharp, jagged edges. The plant's name is culantro, and it grows like a weed. I'm Clarissa Way, and you're listening to Climate Cuisine, a podcast that explores how sustainable ingredients are grown and prepared in similar climate zones around the world. Now in the hands of different cultures, one ingredient can take on so many wondrous forms. And as the world faces dramatic upward shifts in our base temperature, climate-centric discussions on crops will become increasingly important to the resiliency of our food systems. So far, we've talked about cassava, bananas, taros, cactus, and breadfruit, all rather robust ingredients. But today's episode is centered around a smaller plant. It's all about culantro, cilantro's tropical counterpart. It looks similar to a dandelion green, but tastes exactly like cilantro. The episode today is also a larger story on how limited our repertoire of herbs are and the possibilities that come when we expand that repertoire beyond what's just available at the grocery store. So I'm starting today's episode in conversation with a Puerto Rican food blogger who has written quite a bit about culantro in her recipes. It's one of the key ingredients in sofrito which is the foundation for a lot of sauces in Puerto Rican cuisine. My name is Reina Gascon Lopez. I am a chef and food blogger behind the Sofrito Project, originally from Puerto Rico, and I live in Charleston, South Carolina. It's honestly one of my favorite herbs. I feel like it's super underrated. Unfortunately, I have a really hard time finding it here in Charleston. And ironically enough, my mom is actually growing a huge batch of culantro at her house. She lives on James Island, which is a little bit closer to the beach. And she has had amazing luck with growing gulantro. She has like a huge bed of it. And she ended up getting the seeds from, I think, one of our cousins in Puerto Rico. We just brought it back and we were just like, we have to grow it because we can't find it here. It took a couple tries for her to get it really going, but now it's kind of growing like weeds. She's got an entire bed and then there's like a segment of the yard that she sectioned off for her gardening stuff. And that's just completely been overtaken by gulantro, which is amazing to smell. Anytime you go in the backyard, you just smell it and it's so good. Botanically related to the cilantro, culantro is an herb that originates from the tropical parts of Latin America. Think of culantro as cilantro's more pungent cousin. While it grows in northeastern sections of the United States and thrives in shaded wet areas, it's still mostly only used by immigrant communities who buy it as a specialty item. Rich in calcium, it has a medicinal value as well. Some cultures will boil the leaves and roots and drink the tea for flu or fevers. It's also said to help against convulsions. And hey, if you get stung by a scorpion, the roots apparently can be consumed raw to help heal that. 
Its scientific name is derived from the Latin word stink or bad odor, and sometimes it's been compared to the smell of a crushed bed bug. That's a bit harsh, because to me, it just smells and tastes like a really intense cilantro. It's sustainable because unlike cilantro, which needs to be reseeded every year, culantro is a biannual, which means it has a lifespan of two years. It's an underrated herb that is relatively pest and disease free and can be an alternative for people who live in hotter climates who cannot grow cilantro. In places like the Caribbean, it is as weedy as a dandelion and most people have wild clumps of it hanging around the front of their house. Just cut off the leaves around the center of the plant and it will just continue to grow. While it might go dormant during the winter in colder subtropical places, it will easily reseed itself and grow again. And it just doesn't require much maintenance at all. And from a culinary perspective, it can be used exactly like cilantro, though it typically has a stronger flavor. But unlike cilantro, which is a much daintier plant, culantro should be added during the cooking process rather than afterwards. We typically use it as part of the base for sofrito, which is the seasoning base that we use for a lot of our dishes. Back in Puerto Rico, you know, it's obviously easier to find. So that's typically used more than cilantro is. But when we moved to the States, you know, we couldn't find it. So cilantro is what we ended up using. When I am able to get it and my mom is able to bring me some, I typically mix it in and add it to the cilantro. So I could kind of get like, you know, I kind of stretch it, I guess you could say. That's usually the main way we use it. I love, honestly, just taking a leaf or two and just throwing it in a pot of beans or some stew, a soup. I, I put it in anything savory that needs a nice, like, earthy kick. I just, I love how it smells kind of like dirt. It just smells like outside. <laughs> I think it's so great. I kind of like to describe culantro as cilantro's, like, rowdy cousin. It's very, like, in your face. Like, you could smell it a mile away when you're using it. And I could honestly tell the difference when sofrito has it or it doesn't. Like, as soon as it hits the pan, you could smell it, and you're like, oh, there's no culantro in that. And then, you know, I just like to describe it as kind of being in your face. It's very pungent. So if you're not a fan of cilantro, you're not going to be a fan of culantro. It's like... Hardcore. <laughs> While it's been a staple ingredient for Latin American cultures, only recently has it made it into the mainstream American culinary lexicon, where it is still largely imported in from the Caribbean. It's starting to pick up a little bit, especially now that I feel like lately people have been more open to trying new cuisines and, and trying different dishes. Anytime that I write a recipe that calls for culantro, I always make a note of telling people where they could find it, and I try to describe it for people who may not know what it is. But I, I love it. Like, sometimes I'm able to find it at my local Asian market, and I'll buy, like, the entire shelf of it. Like, I'll just take all the bags and just, like, throw it in my cart and be like, all right, I'm stocking up. I'm going to just portion and freeze it, and it's going to be great. Now that you mentioned the climate change, it speaks to that because it's starting to get hot enough here where she could grow it pretty much year round without an issue. You know, during the winter months, it'll kind of go dormant. She'll harvest all the seeds and kind of like, you know, retail the dirt a bit. But otherwise, for most of the year, it's rocking and rolling. Like it's just growing like crazy. It's, it's cool, but it's also kind of scary. It's like, why are we able to grow all of this, you know, now? And it's like, that actually says a lot, which is kind of unfortunate, but you know. It's just things that we're going to have to deal with. There is a downside to culantro, however, which is that it's rather spiky along the edges. Whereas cilantro is fluffy and soft, culantro has serrated edges, so you have to be careful while processing it. Its nickname? Sawtooth cilantro. I just cut them off. I mean, it's anything that, you know, if it's thorny or if it's a little prickly, it's, you know, I feel like that comes with the territory when you're using any kind of fresh produce, you just kind of have to deal with it and, and make it work. <laughs> I like running it through a food processor and putting it in ice cube trays and just freezing it. And then I just like pop that into like, you know, soup or whatever, or beans when I'm making it. And it's not just Puerto Rican and Latin American cuisine where it's popular. Culantro has made its way over to Asia where it's a really important flavor agent. It's blended into curries in Thailand and India and used as flavor in broths in Vietnam. To learn more, I called up Andrea Nguyen, a James Beard award-winning cookbook author who specializes in Vietnamese cooking. Cilantro and culantro. <laughs> 
spelled nearly the same, right? But they're they're different in the sense that cilantro is sort of universally used in Vietnamese cooking, mostly raw as a garnish, or we wrap foods up with lettuce and herbs and stuff like that. Whereas culantro, I have really only seen it used in pho as part of the garnish plate and added directly to the bowl. So it's not used in the way that say Puerto Ricans or Dominican Republic cooks or or Cuban cooks would use it in a sofrito kind of method where it is a base for stews or marinades and it's used, you know, oftentimes in conjunction with cilantro too. And the wonderful thing about culantro is that its flavor is retained once it hits the hot broth, because the leaf itself is sturdier. It's thick, right? It's got those thorns. It's not going to get eaten easily. It retains its color, retains its flavor. Whereas cilantro, even though we may hit our bowls with cilantro, and, and I love it, it is not as strong. It's a much more delicate player in a bowl of pho. But otherwise than that, I rarely see culantro in other places in Vietnamese cooking. In the Vietnamese kitchen, if you're lucky when you sit down to a bowl of pho, you'll see it in the States or in Vietnam, mostly in Southern Vietnam. In Northern Vietnam, you're not going to see it because it's not a traditional Northern Vietnamese pho herb. The thing with the cilantro notes in Vietnamese cooking, it comes from like three sources. You know, you've got cilantro itself. You know, we talked about culantro. And then there's also rau ram, or Vietnamese cilantro, or hot mint, or laksa. And that's, you know, also like this this herb that is more widely used in Vietnamese cooking than culantro is. And it's a sturdier herb, and it will retain that fragrance. And it has this little, like, retention of heat in the back of your mouth. And it's where, like, people who don't cilantro hate rau ram. But they may be able to withstand culantro, I hear. So I'm curious, are you able to grow culantro at all in the Bay Area? I used to like keep the darn thing all year round, but lately, I don't know if it's climate change or not, but it dies back and I'm always like taking cuttings and then rooting it and growing it again in my garden. So here in Taiwan, where I live, culantro grows pretty well. We have the same climate as Vietnam and I have it on a planter in my balcony. But because Taiwan has a long history of colonization centered around Chinese culture, cilantro is the preferred aromatic, even though its tropical cousin does a lot better here climate-wise. And I think that's a really key example about how colonialism and an increasingly globalized supply chain has fueled this selective amnesia on what ends up on our dinner plates. We think about sustainability in such black and white terms while eating less meat and prioritizing locally grown produce are all amazing and impactful steps to take, sometimes it's a matter of being present, of looking at what's around you, the climate, and rethinking the ingredients that make up our pantry. Talking to Andrea really made me think about how limited we are in our herb selections. While there are 50,000 species of edible plants in the world, roughly 90% of the foods that we consume only come from just about 30 plants. And it's not just cilantro or culantro or oregano and Cuban oregano. There are 600 types of mints and 100 types of basil. I think about shiso a lot and sorrel. So shiso in Vietnamese cooking and also in Chinese cooking will use a type of shiso that is garnet on the underside and green on the top side. And it has a, you know, minty, basil-y, it just has this beautiful taste and it's a perilla frutescens and so people think of say korean uses for perilla but once we get to southeast asia it's this other two-tone favorite and also people think of the the delicate green shisos and red shisos of japanese cooking but frankly when i've like told my friends my japanese friends and shown them vietnamese shiso they're like oh so strong And I'm like, it's like the poor man shiso, and we call it theotho, and it is very affordable. So, you know, get with it. (laughs) And so I will grow the Vietnamese shiso. But once in a while, like 
my Japanese shiso totally reseeds itself so easily in my Bay Area garden. I have had the same plant come back now for five years, and I have like a mini field of it to the point where recently I picked a bunch and I brought it to my mom, who's 87, and she tasted it and she's like, oh my God, it's just a k i t o the Vietnamese herb. And I'm like, it's the Japanese. Brother or cousin, mom, and she's like, Well, it doesn't matter. It's great. And it looks like it's easy to grow. So she started rooting it. <laughs> she like, st- stripped most of the leaves off and then she stuck it in water. She had a friend come over, and both of those women, you know, her friends like in her late 70s, they taste and they're like, Oh, it's d i e t o And then I started seeing it being sold. And I'm talking about the green Japanese shiso. I started seeing starters at Vietnamese markets in San Jose. This seems to be a common thread with immigrants bringing over herbs that they use in their home country or putting their own spin on local herbs. And I think it's in certain ways a little easier to grow and reseed in our climate. And so I think that that has been really interesting. Another herb that people who, Vietnamese folks who've come to the US have taken to is sorrel because of its tartness or sorrel, some people call it. That's typically used in French cooking. But people are always looking for that, that kind of like、uh, edge of sour when they're putting together vegetable and herb plates and they're eating something that's really rich tasting, you know, whether it's like grilled pork or beef or something. You just want that little contrast. So they like looked around and they're like, oh, here's this sorrel, you know? I'm just gonna add it to my herb plate. If you don't know what sorrel or sorrel is, take a closer look at your lawn or on the edges of a nearby park. It grows all over the world. It's basically a clover with purple or yellow flowers and has a wonderfully tart taste to it. All parts of it are edible, including the leaves, flowers, and roots. And it's considered a weed. Now, too much of it is not necessarily a good thing because it contains high levels of oxalic acid. But it works beautifully as a garnish on a dish and to add a hit of acid. And the thing is, is that we think of herbs as being these fixed things in, in food. But it's really what you have growing around you that can add flavor and texture and, frankly, phytochemicals to your diet. And if you eat them a lot, like, They're consumed in certain parts of the world, you're getting a bunch of really wonderful, you know, natural essences to your body that's going to help combat disease. You know, you see it all the time. You look this stuff up, they list all of these diseases, and you're like, my God, I could be like a walking health bomb if I ate enough herbs. There are probably dozens of local herbs near you that you didn't even know about. Here in Taiwan, where I live, the indigenous Taiwanese people who lived in the mountains far away from the sea used sumac trees, specifically the Roxburgh sumac, to season their food. It was a salt substitute for them. In Los Angeles, there's a sumac bush colloquially known as lemonade sumac, whose berries taste exactly like lemonade. Here in Taiwan, I grow a tree known in English as tuna sinensis, or shangtun, or Chinese mahogany. It's also known as the beef and onion plant because it literally smells like a beef and onion stir fry. The leaves are lovely when crushed together and rubbed on proteins, or grounded with nuts and a pesto. It's one of my favorite flavoring agents of all time. But outside of Asia, it's mostly used as an ornamental tree. One of the herbs that I noted in Sichuan when I was in Chengdu was fish mint. It was picked very tender and young, just really these soft, lithe leaves, and made into this incredible salad with a lot of chilies and soy sauce. Fish mint's like a big deal to mostly like people of the older generation, to tell you the truth. My father adored it, and he would say, like, Oh, you know, it, fish mint's great for all kinds of things. Well, it'll treat your hemorrhoids. And it's very, very popular with a certain generation because, as you know, it takes getting used to. And it will grow as an invasive species in your yard. I don't know if you've noticed that because this friend of mine said, Oh my gosh, look. It's dip ga, which is a term in Vietnamese. And I was like, ah! But it was with 
chilies and soy sauce and probably some vinegar too. It's again a raw thing, it eaten raw. You're not just using it on a lettuce plate. Sometimes you're eating dinner and you just have a plate of herbs and some sliced cucumber and it provides these contrasts, you know. In short, herbs and spices have been used for as long as human history. And the selection that we're presented with at the grocery store is but a fraction of what could be available. Of course, what's available depends on where in the world you are, and culantra only makes sense for people in hotter regions. It can be grown in temperate parts of the world, of course, but will only thrive in the summers. Culantro grows like a weed in certain parts of the world. And, you know, you've seen it growing cracks on the street practically, right? But it's like really hard to grow in the sense that the single leaves come from like the center stem. So, you know, you're you're not getting many branches. You're just like getting these long leaves and you have to harvest them to get new ones. So it's like hard if you grow them in a more temperate zone. In my sense of it, I feel like it is a much more precious herb to me. When you think about the history of culantro being a new world herb and cilantro being an old world herb, that, you know, here in the new world, even though we're much more familiar with cilantro, there may be a time when culantro is king. A thank you to the Climate Cuisine team. Co-producer and audio editor Kat Hong, researcher Olivia Maeda, production assistant Xin Yun, and intern Indio Clarkson. I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder Stephen Satterfield, Whetstone Radio Collective executive producer Celine Glazier, sound engineer Max Katolchak, associate producer Quentin Lebeau, and sound intern Simon Lavender. You can learn more about this podcast at whetstoneradio.com, on Instagram and Twitter at Whetstone Radio, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Whetstone Radio Collective, for more podcast video content. And you can learn more about all things happening at Whetstone at whetstonemedia.com.